same place uh, at September 8, 1999. And uh, we're going to do another one of our interviews uh, that we've done so many of. Uh, the Historical Society has been uh, racing against time here and trying to interview all of the veterans in Montgomery County. I've got some to go yet. <laughs> but uh, uh, today, we, uh, I'm Bob Wormley and I'm the, uh, on the Oral History Committee uh, of the Historical Society and doing the camera work today, what we might call the Executive Director. Our uh, the person we're interviewing today is Mark Karras. And I'm Mark, why don't you tell us your uh, full name and your uh, date of birth and how old you are? My full name is Mark Hannah Karras. That's H A N N A H, spelled the same way frontwards and backwards. Karras sometimes is caress to some members of the family, but we normally call it Karras around Crawfordsville and other places at that time. Anyway, I was born in Elnora, Indiana, E-L-N-O-R-A, down in Davies County, southern Indiana. I like to say I moved to Bedford as soon as I heard about it. Actually, I moved to Bedford when I was three years old and grew up actually in Bedford, Indiana, which is south of uh, Bloomington, about 25 miles, in Lawrence County. So that's that's the beginning, Bob. Okay. And who were your folks? My folks were Charles Karras, Charles W., I mean Charles Lemon Karras. I had a brother named Charles Warren. Charles Lemon Karras, my mother was Gladys Hannah, therefore the, the middle name of Hannah was the family name of my mother. They were both from H A N N A H. Oh, spelled the same I way frontwards and backwards. Oh, okay, I, I didn't get the A. Yeah, the, the H oh, on the end, yeah. Last H. But it's a family name. Yeah. It was my mother's but, name. Uh, what uh, descent is that? What? Well, I always thought I was Dutch Irish yeah. until I learned that my great grandmother's name was Plumerfelt. So I decided there, there were more Dutch than there was Irish. Oh, there. okay. So I really think, Bob, it is primarily is a, a Dutch a Dutch derivation uh -huh. of some kind or another. And uh, where you went, where did you go to school? Went to school in Bedford through the entire 12 grades, graduated in Bedford okay. High School in 1941. Okay. And uh, where did you go to college? Went to college at IU. I had all three degrees. I went to the University of Pennsylvania, that we'll get into during the discussion because it was part of the regular service of the uh, of the time. Now, uh, when did you get out of high school? In high school in 1941. So, and uh, what was your, did you go four years of college then? No, 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 was, college was all after the war. Okay. Uh, that, college was after the war. That right? no, straightens no, that out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, that and uh, what happened when you graduated from High school. Well, after I graduated from high school, I knew, of course, the war was imminent. Pearl Harbor hadn't yeah. occurred yet, but the war was imminent, and so, uh, first of all, I was finding a job. I got a job in Indianapolis and worked three weeks at uh, the hardware store, Van Camp Hardware Store in Indianapolis, and learned I had to have my appendix out. So I had to make oh. the money to pay for it, so I worked then and for another couple of weeks with Coca-Cola Company, and that time the appendix had to come out, so I came back to Bedford and had my appendix out. Oh. Then started looking for a job. The war still wasn't Pearl Harbor time yet. Oh. So I got a job at Crane Naval Ammunition Depot down in southern Indiana. And at the age of 19, I was the chief safety inspector with four safety inspectors supposedly oh. working for me. Well, the reason was I happened to be hired first. That's the reason I was the chief, was I was hired first. But anyway, I worked at that job and stayed at that until uh, after Pearl Harbor. Oh, what what were, they, uh, were they doing at uh, Crane? At Crane, they were, it was a storage facility for storing yeah. of uh, munitions and that type uh -huh. of One of the biggest operations actually in the country. Do uh, you have a sense down there of what you were doing, why, well, why my, you were... Well, my particular job, or you mean what the mission well, was? Well, the we're mission. working at a, at a naval depot where you, where you got all this war material, you must have figured, well, this stuff is going to be used here pretty that, soon. That's right, exactly. That's, that was okay. part of it. Was preparing for all that most people thought, and in true in most instances, we weren't preparing for war, but we have to. We actually were, uh -huh. and that was the purpose of that job was to, to build this vast over covering many square miles of territory to store out and out in the fields and all where it was uh -huh. not subject to explosion to store yeah. all these materials. Yeah. Okay, and uh, you were the chief inspector. I was called the chief safety inspector. That's right. There were two professional engineers and me and four other fellows that I think they just picked up out around the county someplace. Uh -huh. but 
What was during the early days of construction, of course, the, the government was beginning to get yeah. into, into safety factors, and so they required that, that the constru construction company have a, a group of inspectors to be sure that safety uh -huh. standards were followed. Did, did, did they ever have any explosions? No, never, never, never did, Bob. Never did any never. time. And our job is to inspect construction, not inspect the, the uh, oh. explosives or anything of that kind. We were to uh, inspect the buildings that were being put up and the storage oh. sheds that were to go into the hills. And well, that led, uh, you hung around there and, and they got your appendix out. And <laughs> that seems to me, how could a guy have earn enough money to get an appendix well, out. Uh, I'll tell you exactly how it happened. You know how I paid for that appendix? I drove the doctor for a month around on making his calls on weekends. <laughs> and that's exactly right. He had that agreement. So Mark, I'll tell you what I'll do. So that, well, I'll, I'll let you off and you don't have to pay me a thing, but you drive me on four weekends so I can kind of rest between, that's when doctors that, still made That wouldn't have been Dr. Wynn, was no, it? No, that wasn't Dr. Wynn. I knew Dr. Wynn. Did Dr. you? Wynn, yeah, but he was not my that, doctor. That would have been a Dr. Wynn would have been practicing down there. Yeah, he but, was. I knew Dr. Yeah. Wynn, of course, no that's Brooks. Uh, Helen. No Brooks and Helen and yeah. here now. Yeah. I knew their, his brother and sisters, brothers yeah. and sister, I mean, uh, yeah. Brooks and all. Anyway, yeah, yeah they, were, they were friends. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, all right, go on with the story. Well, I, of course, it was at uh, Crane and uh, along about, well, early summer, early to mid-summer of uh, 1941, this was. Uh -huh. And my two closest buddies were drafted. So I well, my gosh, I just better go along with them. So I'll, I'll go in and enlist. Huh. I did go in and enlist, but the drawback was they said, well, your buddies have to go next week. We said, you won't go until we call you. Oh. And this was uh, probably June or July. So anyway, I was, went right on working and all. And now, was this what uh, the branch of the service? Well, the Army? I, no, I enlisted, period. I enlisted for, for the, not for the draft, because I wasn't drafted. Yeah, right. no, anyway, I didn't know that until I was later assigned when I got to Indianapolis. I didn't know which branch I would be in. Oh. At that time, you enlisted, you, you could make a general enlistment, which I mm -hmm. did. And yeah. fortunately, as it turned out, fortunately, I did get into the Air Force, and we'll get into that a little later with classification oh. and all. But anyway, uh, okay. anyway, they, they left in uh, early summer, and they said, you, you know, you can't go with them. You've got to wait. <laughs> so I waited anyway, and then on the uh, first week in September, and I was told to report to Indianapolis at Fort Benjamin Harrison. Yeah. And so I did, reported to Fort Ben, got on the bus in Bedford with, oh, probably there were 18 or 19 of us, I guess, going together on that yeah. same day. Went to Fort Harrison, in Indianapolis, and went through a long series of classification and so forth. And yeah. it was determined that uh, I did, I guess, did pretty well in the testing. And at that time, so I learned later, at that time they were taking the higher classification people for the Air Force. Or yeah. Air, Air Corps, that day it wasn't the Air Force, it was the Air Corps, the Army Air Corps. Yeah. And then they would, maybe later on, as I learned later, they would like, take the, the highest average of grades for the uh, Navy, and then later on for the Marines. But that time it was the Air Corps. Yeah. So I got into the Air Corps by, I think, good fortune, actually, and uh, stayed then at uh, Fort Harrison for about a week, I think, before we were shipped south. You took the Army General Classification took the Army General, General Classification score, yeah, <laughs> that is right. And I tell my grandkids, did very well on the kids. <laughs> But anyway, yes, that, that was the test that we all took, and the classification was made from... from yeah, there. I used to administer those tests. You used to do that, yeah. <laughs> well, go, go ahead, then. You're, uh, well, we, we loaded on the train then, and I, even though... Uh, I, went down to Union Station. We went then. down to Union Station, got on... No, now wait, that isn't right, Bob. We didn't go to Union Station. They had a spur they brought out to uh, Fort Harrison. Was there, there okay. Were, there were many, many people going. It was a, they loaded the whole troop train on the same... Uh -huh. What, now, what, would the, what would the date have been about when That you, would have been oh, September the 15th, maybe, 1942. 1942. 1942, yeah, this was after so Pearl the, Harbor. Uh, it was after Pearl Harbor then? Yeah, it was after Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor okay. December of 71, and then I went in and, well, I enlisted in June of 70, uh, 42, mm -hmm. but then didn't get called. Can you remember, uh, Mark, what, what you were doing on the day that... Uh, Oh, uh, Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Absolutely. I was in the filling station playing a pinball machine. <laughs> and literally was literally pulling the thing back, letting it go, and the word came over and there were oh maybe a half dozen kids loafing who loafed at the filling station in there. Yeah. I was playing a pinball machine in the filling station when, when Pearl Harbor was announced. Yeah. yeah. And oh. that, that was another thing too, of course, that let us let us know it wouldn't be too long. We need to, yeah. And it did happen, I mean what well, earlier we thought it wouldn't be too long yeah. to die and here it came. Okay, um, and uh, 
Go ahead. I can well, I mean, interrupt. I, well, you interrupt any time. It helps me okay. get prompted when you, okay. when you ask about that. Well, we got on this troop train, of course, to go south. I'd never, never been any further south than Louisville, Kentucky, in my life. I hitchhiked and rode freights all the way to okay. California, but, uh, but I hadn't. But I hadn't. Uh, but you really, uh, you had been out of. Uh, uh, Lawrence County. Oh, I mean, I've been out of Lawrence County. Well, as I say, I hitchhiked and rode freight trains to the San Francisco World's Fair in California. Huh. A buddy of mine and I. And what, what year was that? This was 19, uh, 1940, between my junior and senior years in high say, school. Say, I think maybe I've heard some stories about that. You've thing. heard my most harrowing experience. I may get touch on this later on. I never in all the war, even though I didn't have a rough, rough time. I went through over 200 bombing attacks during the war and never, ever was as scared as I was at night. I was locked in a boxcar in the Rocky Mountains. Oh, boy. And that's another story. Well, I mean another story. Well, we're going to cover <coughs> we, want, we want to cover that, too, so why don't you tell about it right now? Uh, okay. This was, I've got, I've got a writing thing in here. Some, no, I didn't bring one. I don't think. Anyway, and this buddy of mine and I were coming back, and we, we were going, of course, coming east, and we got into freight yards. We Who's your buddy? buddy named Ralph Turpin. He's Is now, he he's around now dead. No, Ralph's dead. Okay. He, he was one of the buddies that I thought I was going into the service with. Uh -huh. uh, I enlisted so I could win with him. He was one of those buddies. Anyway, we were in the <coughs> in, Evanston, in Evanston, Wyoming, and we were headed for uh, North Platte, North North Platte, Nebraska. That's where the train was supposed to go. We thought, and we got on this box car and sat settled back in there, and two other fellows and we didn't know at all. How did you get? Where'd you board that train? In the, in the freight yards. In whereabouts? In, in Wyoming. Evanston, Wyoming. Well, how'd you get to Wyoming? Well, we hitchhiked from San Francisco. Oh, okay. We, we rode the freights going out, too, sometimes. You, you know? did? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. When you ride the freights, what, what do you mean you ride? I mean, you just throw your suitcase. We were carrying suitcases. We didn't have backpacks, and we'd throw your suitcase on the boxcar and climb up in. On one occasion, we went through, frankly, by one of the impressive scenes of my life. We went through the, the beautiful part of the Rocky Mountains in a gondola, which is an open boxcar, not a uh -huh. uh, a freight car, but that, that was open. I could haul coal in. This one was empty. And we rode in it and looked out on that massive grandeur of those Rocky Mountains at first, the break of dawn. We were, we were riding through the Rocky Mountains on a boxcar, I mean, on a, a flat car, looking up at those skies. Pretty cold. It was pretty cold. It was pretty chilly. Yeah. But anyway, we, this, this boxcar incident, we were coming home and we were locked in actually because we learned later and the fact that the Burlington Zephyr, remember the old Zephyr that was the fastest sure. thing around? Well, the Burlington Zephyr had a, a door bounce off of a boxcar and, and hit the front of it and do some damage. So, and as I say, we learned all this later on. But anyway, the uh, uh, conductors and the people in the freights were given orders then to lock all the boxcar doors so they couldn't jump off and fall on anything. So while we were in there sleeping, waiting for the train to pull out, they came along and locked that boxcar door. Oh, boy. And instead of going to North Platte, Nebraska, we were going to, uh, we learned again, because we got off in Denver. South. We also learned later that the, what they were doing then was taking these boxcars they'd been loading wheat in up to the Rocky Mountains to store them for the for the rest of the summer and into the winter until oh, the, the next God. season. We learned all that later, but that's what it was. Anyway, we came down. This was uh, oh just after dark when we were locked in. The freight came rolling, and <clears throat> about every so often, the, after a period of hours, the freight would stop, and we'd hear a clanking way up the line, all gradually coming closer and closer. Again, all this is learned later on, so we didn't know a thing about it in that boxcar, but about every so many miles in the mountains, they have to come back and check the journal boxes. They called them. They had to be sure there was grease on the journal yeah. boxes. So going up and down the mountains, they wouldn't catch on fire and start burning. So every time they made a stop, they'd work maybe 20 or 30 cars back and then take off again and stop another 50 miles yeah. and work 20 or 30. Well, anyway, finally, the fellow got back to where, where we were. And we screamed and yelled and pounded and all. The guy heard us and he unlocked the door. He looked in there and he just gave us the awfulest cussing you ever heard in your life, but we had kissed him right on the mouth. <laughs> and seriously, the dawn, the dawn was just breaking. Oh, he, he did. He just literally gave, gave us the dickens because they were arresting you know, people going on the right. How long did you put caught in there? All night. All night. Oh. Uh, from about 7 o'clock in the evening until uh, How dawn, cold dawn the next that? morning. How cold was Well, we, we weren't thinking about cold. Believe me, we were just doing a lot of praying. Oh. And, Figuring how in the world we were ever, if, if there was any way in the world to try to scratch this box car was built in a whole tons and tons and tons of, of material and all, we thought maybe we'd kick the door down. <laughs> <laughs> huh. 
anyway, that was the most harrowing experience still today. I mean, I, I sometimes think about that in, in all my war experiences, again, which were not severe particularly, but anyway, in all my war experiences, I never ever was as scared as I was yeah. that, that night in the boxcar. Okay. I've cut you off here. Go ahead and start talking. Let's talk about now getting, getting to, into service. Getting to Florida. Okay. Well, we took off from uh, Fort Harrison on the troop train. Well, kind of a, it, it, uh, those old wooden... No, this wasn't. I've got a story later about a, about a boxcar. I mean, not about a boxcar, but about a, about a yeah, troop train. But this was reasonably modern train. We went right along in comforts. And, and we didn't have any bunks or anything that sort of. We all had to sleep sitting up in our seats for the one night. We were, we were out yeah. all night. Anyway, we went down, and the thing about that impressed me at the time, I can remember now, was going from season to season. You know, we went south, this was late September, yeah. or mid-September anyway, when the seasons were about ready to change. And I can remember now going into, into uh, through Kentucky and down into Georgia and all that. As you went along, the weather got warmer and warmer, and how nice it was yeah. to, to see that difference in the weather. Yeah. So we went to uh, the train and finally took it to St. Petersburg, Florida. And they unloaded us, and we were there for about about three days, I think, and then they moved us over to Clearwater, Florida. And we had to take our rough, basic training in the Fort Harrison Hotel. In Florida. Fort, Fort Harrison Hotel in Florida, which I think had seven stories at that time. And uh, part of our training was having to walk those. You couldn't take the elevator. You had to walk up and down the oh. Except that the big ballroom, after most of our basic training, was calisthenics and that sort of thing, and the, uh, the big ballroom of this... Fort Harrison Hotel, yeah. where we'd take calisthenics and gather around and... Uh, you know, had you been uh, assigned to your branch had, had not, not been assigned, been assigned to the branch. I knew I was Air Corps. Yeah, okay. Was, no, this was just Air Corps that, that okay. went there. So I wasn't any question about that, where I was going to be, but uh, of course I had no idea where I'd be sent after, okay. basic. But figuring by the basic training, oftentimes it would be three months, four months, or something like that. Well, mine was okay. three weeks uh -huh. at this hotel. One little incident, Bob, too. Three again. weeks of basic training. Three right? weeks of basic training. That, prim very that much. primarily consisted of KP and calisthenics. That's mainly what yeah. I was. So that wasn't very much. But one of my stories there, and I'll, I'll interject this if I may as I go along with, when I think of a story involved with one yeah. particular place I was, I'll tell you about it. But the thing, my only recollection, not only, but my major recollection of that was the first sergeant was a, a former professional wrestler. Uh -huh. And the first time we got up to this ballroom, he gathered all the people were gathered around him. He gave his speech, walking up and down, calling and yelling to you and all about things. We said, now, just one thing I want all of you to know. This town's got sailors, and it's got Marines, and it's got us Air Corps men. Huh. Now, if you walk into a bar and you sit down and some guy comes up, a Marine walks up beside you and starts juggling and bothering you a little bit, you get up and you walk away from him. Huh. But be sure that son of a gun stretched out flat on the floor before you do. <laughs> And the next day, ironically, the next day he was beaten to a pulp. And that night he got into a big brawl, and he was black and blue. <laughs> the next next day, he was an Air Force. He, he was an Air Corps <laughs> master sergeant. The master sergeant. He was the one that laid down the rules around there. Anyway, that was a, a side note. My only experience about about the Fort Harrison Hotel and my basic training. Didn't, didn't you? Uh, didn't you have any? Uh, Rifle train? Not, not the least bit, Bob. I had, was issued a rifle there overseas. Yeah. I was issued a rifle. We were always operating along the perimeter. Anyway, no, didn't have any kind of marksmanship or shooting. Never so shot, a, ne never shot a gun in the... In the in oh, the, take a rifle of never, or anything? Never even saw a rifle. Didn't see oh. anything of that sort. Of thing. Oh. As I say, I was issued one later on and, and yeah. shot it then, but uh, mm -hmm. not... Matter of fact, in, term, in terms of guns, again, it wasn't because of an awful war, but I don't, I had a twenty-two rifle at home with my own and uh -huh. used to shoot rabbits, hunt rabbits with them. When I came home in the service, the first day I was home, I had my rabbit hunting with my rifle uh -huh. and killed one rabbit. I came home and started to skin it. And about halfway through, I threw it in the garden stand. I've never fired a gun since. Oh. Well, well, go ahead. Uh, you, you mean you didn't have bayonet training? I not, didn't have to stab a single, <laughs> didn't have to stab a single Japanese soldier in the Never did, never that always, was, always was never had Most disgusting part of the war. <laughs> well, I owned later on, I owned a rising submachine gun and, and my M1 carbine that I was issued. The rising oh. submachine gun was, was not issued, but anyway, I had one. <laughs> okay, well. I never learned how to use it. You, uh, you rode in a fancy 
train down to Florida. Yeah, it was. It was. It was a very comfortable train down there. No, I said later on. I'll tell you about another one I rode. Okay, well, go ahead. Well, this is later on in, in the All sequence, right. mean, but All right. anyway, uh, I got my assignment then. I was to go to, to Biloxi, Keesler Field in Biloxi, Mississippi. Yeah. So I got down there and then was assigned to airplane mechanic school. And that's oh. what, the, of course, Keesler had many, many operations, but one of them had the, the airplane mechanic school for B-24s. It uh -huh. was located at, at Keesler. Okay. And Keesler, if you've ever been, been there, of course, it's a resort town and on right on the Gulf of, yep. Gulf of Mexico and a very, very pretty place. Well, it was, still is today, even though they've had some pretty serious, uh, uh, not tornado, what's the word I want, like they're having now. Typhoon. Typhoon. Uh, there's another word I'm trying to think of anyway. Anyway, the storm, severe storm has wiped them out two or three times. They always yeah. come back and build up after that. But, but Keesler was a, a southern town, but we uh, I was assigned to airplane mechanic school, B-24s. Oh. B-24 is a big four engine, what we call the flying oh. box car at that time. And yeah. It was. It was even bigger than the B-17 as so far as weight and, and size yeah. was concerned. A little bigger than, mm -hmm. than the 17. So anyway, my job was assigned to go to school and learn how to maintain, take care of that aircraft as a member, part of the ground crew for, for the airplane. Mm -hmm. And this was six months. It was a six months training program, and that's what, what it was. That's how long we lasted. And then I graduated from that and was to be assigned to many of them. That oh, was that uh, so about what time frame? And, oh, okay. We'll get into the time frame. I went down there in uh, late September of 42 and then finished the school at the end of March of 40, 43. Oh, okay. March, March 43 now in time sequence. Okay. I just finished uh, airplane mechanic school at, at Biloxi. And then I'm waiting then for the assignment. At that time, you had, normally there were two choices. One or not that you had a choice, but you were assigned normally to either go to gunner school because normally the, the mechanic, maybe okay. it was the engine, the engine, the flight engineer on the air on a flying crew, the, the mechanic was the oh. flight engineer. And he also was the waste gunner. The, the B-24 yep. had guns on both sides, the gun on the top and the gun on the bottom. The guns at the bottom. Gun, the gun Where the bottom. were you? I mean, I, did, I didn't get into that. Well, oh. I later, I got the script, I later rode the, the top turret for test hops, or a okay. te test hop or two like that. Okay. Was later on, well, that runs the sequence. But anyway, we finished, uh, finished mechanics school and waiting around the assignments from Norman, which would be to gunner school or directly to an assignment of as an airplane, airplane mechanic. Uh -huh. And many of my buddies went, went took the, the gunner school. My the closest friend that I had of all the fellows I went into service with was a fellow I grew up with. And all he was killed over Germany, but as, as oh. a waste gunner was shot down over Germany and killed. And, and the first first loss many friends that I had had some others later on. But anyway, while I was waiting then for for that, I decided, well, why don't I apply for a pilot training? I've been in the service for not quite a year, but. Oh. More than half year and also by the way. The guys, is, get, the guys have got the grave here. Still fellows. over in the U.S.A. Still in Keesler. Still in Keesler. Still in Keesler, yeah. Still in Keesler Field, yeah. So I applied for uh, pilot training, was accepted as a, uh, for the program. You don't know whether you're going to be a pilot or a bombardier or an engineer. Yeah. And Jack Roberts, as you remember, Jack started as a navigator and then yeah. was going to bombardier school too. Then later on when the, when the war ended. Yeah. Flew all of these missions, of course, in uh, in England and got home safely. Anyway, the uh, application was made, and I was accepted for uh, aviation cadet training. <coughs> and went then uh, here again. We're April, probably end of April by now of uh, '43, oh. and I went to uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville was a big classification center then for yeah. uh, for uh, flight training. Oh. So I went to Nashville and it was there about about three weeks, I think, getting my assignment again, testing for. Where where, where was that uh, uh, in Nashville? What where was that? It, it, it was southeast, and I don't remember remember mm -hmm. frankly about where the uh, or what. Are you down remember. around Lebanon or where would it be? I, I don't honestly mm -hmm. remember about it. Murfreesboro or somewhere it was like southeast, that. Southeast, I think, but it was really yeah. far because I went in yeah. on well, well, nights I can go into Nashville. Yeah, so I right wouldn't. close by. Okay. As a matter of fact, I mean, I don't, all I ever thought about being was the classification center. It wasn't an airfield, it was, a, mm -hmm. it was more of a yeah. uh, just a little barracks-like uh, situation set up just for the classification of, of cadets. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's my memory of it. But I was there right. about three weeks getting classified and again going through whether I would to okay. be a bombardier, or a navigator, or a pilot, and I was picked for the for the pilot program. Uh -huh. 
Okay, go ahead. Well, I was there about three weeks, and then they shipped us to uh, Maxwell Field in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Okay. Which was a pre-flight called pre-flight training. That's where you first got your uh, your navigation and uh, mm -hmm. coordinates of uh, <clears throat> that kind and the uh, uh, Morse code and uh, well, officer training type. At that time, they were still using the uh, the old uh, West Point system of having each square. In other words, for, for the first three weeks you were there, you were an underclassman. The last three weeks you were an upperclassman. Mm -hmm. And the first three weeks as an underclassman, you had to eat a square meal like this, you know, not saying anything. Oh. Oh. Uh, anyway, they tried to rag you, you know, and, get, and haze you and make it kind of tough on you. But You mentioned the Morris Code. Did you learn the... I, that's probably the reason I wasn't flying an airplane, Bob. I couldn't learn. I had trouble with I didn't say I didn't learn because I didn't have to take a test on it yet. But anyway, I did have trouble with that Morse code. I can't carry a tune. I don't have any any sense of rhythm or anything. The Morse code is a lot of rhythm and all that. Anyway, I, I didn't uh, didn't have to take the test because I washed out before I got to it. Uh -huh. So uh, what happened was I, I did was in about after about three weeks I got oh terrific stomach pain. Later on determined probably an ulcer, but this uh -huh. this was the end. They did give me a choice. I mean, I could, lay back to class and stay and try it again if I wanted to, or I could go home for, for two weeks. Well, okay. I hadn't been home for about a year, and I thought, well, golly, well, it's not a big deal anyway about flying that airplane. I'll just go home, come on back, and get into something else. So yeah. anyway, I took the two weeks home and, and came home after about, uh, this would have been July, probably July of, uh, of 43. So anyway, I, I, I washed out of cadets on a physical, meaning I think no... Uh, anything against my record except the fact yeah. that I did have, they said, had that ulcer and would probably never be accepted. A lot accepted. of, a lot of fellows did. Oh, a lot of them did, Bob. But they, yeah. they said, too, I probably would never be accepted to be a flight crew. I'd have to be, yeah. be ground crew. As it turned out later on, I did fly. I flew test hop and You know, and Mark, it, uh, you, you're talking about it. Uh, I'm impressed on how much moving around we did during the war. Oh, good night, Bob. Yes. Uh, running around, uh, taking us all over the country yeah, on exactly. trains and, yeah. and uh, never knowing where you're going next. That's exactly right, yeah. Bob. An awful but, lot of moving around. <coughs> and sometimes you wonder why, but I guess it all yeah. worked out. Well, I've always been, I've always thought that, and you too probably, that every move I made in the service turned out to be the best move we made because I yeah. got home. That, that you came that home alone. All the county, yeah, and I think that's one of them that's washing out of cadets. And the reason I say that is, my class, my flight class was 44A. That means the first class uh -huh. to graduate in 1944. Yeah. So it turned out the class of 44A, and this is a later story on, but uh -huh. uh, 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 flight admission for which we got the, the unit, our group, got yeah. a presidential citation, was one that most of the pilots were in the 44, 44A, and 44B group, uh -huh. and one third of our outfit was completely wiped out of the target. So I would oh. probably have been in that one third had I been, had yeah. I been flying this. Yeah. But I didn't, I came home. Okay. So you washed out of the cadets, and then what? Well, I got my two weeks at home. Of course, you got to see Barbara and the, the folks and all. And, and now, did you know Barbara? Barbara and I started going together when she was a sophomore and I was a senior in high school. Oh. So it goes way back, <laughs> way back, Robert. It goes way back. As well, a matter of fact, we were, we were engaged before where I went into service and, of course, discussed whether or not it was wise to get married or How old were you? 19. 19. 19. 19. So anyway, we decided that was too early to get married and we knew the war was pending, so mm -hmm. it, was, it was a long, long engagement. Yeah. <laughs> Nearly four years, I mean, I okay. that we were engaged. So anyway, it was Barbara back then and, and still is. Yeah. So anyway, we went to, uh, I came home and went back to Keesler Field, back where I had been for reclassification. Oh. Well, again, I expected fully that I'd be sent into a unit and become an airplane mechanic and go from there. Well, well a new program came along about that time. Mm -hmm. And again, as I say, and my grandkids tease me about this, but I, I tested out pretty well on the class K on the, uh, the Army classification test that you were talking about. I tested out pretty well on that. So they were starting a new program called ASTP. You remember Army Specialized Training uh, Program? Specialized Training. Yeah, and the purpose of that program is to train engineers. What they were mm -hmm. doing then was looking forward to going in, of course, invading uh, Europe and, uh, and needing engineers to mm -hmm. rebuild. And so they were training, but had this, well, just what it was called, Army Specialized Training Program. Yeah. And the specialization was to become an engineer. Mm -hmm. And they were sending, just like the Navy B-12 program, mm -hmm. the B-7 programs, I think, they were similar to those. Anyway, mm -hmm. they send you to colleges, universities, over the country, and 
and start to train you. So anyway, I tested out for, for that and they said, well, all right, you're going to ASTP. This is this brand new great program that we're initiating now, so we're going to sign you for that. So, uh, We've interviewed some other fellows that, have, that were in that program. I think Ken Pomeroy. I think Ken was in the Navy program, the counterpart mm -hmm. with the Navy program. But uh, of course, there are a lot of us in it, a lot of us that were yeah. in the program. Anyway, the, the assignment was made to the ASTP program. I stayed around Biloxi for another maybe two weeks waiting for the for the orders to come to, to okay. ship out. So I finally got those orders and uh, went to uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, to the University of Alabama. Okay. So I arrived in there, oh, I don't remember, like Sunday maybe, and I thought, oh boy, this is going to be great going to the University of Alabama. So anyway, I found out I wasn't going to the University of Alabama at all. That was the classification area to which the, from which they assigned the people yeah. in the program, what university or college they were going to, going to go to. Anyway, I was assigned to uh, University of Pennsylvania. The University of Pennsylvania, as you know, is in Philadelphia, right? Almost downtown Philadelphia, and a great, great physical, as far as physical is concerned, one of the oldest schools in the United States. And just a fine, fine, I thought, we still do, a fine, fine institution. You consider yourself a graduate of... <laughs> no, no, but I consider myself. I usually put on my resume and attend at the University of Pennsylvania. Of course, Roberts, again, though, he's a graduate of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'll get another story on his school later on. But, uh, anyway, uh, we shipped out then after about three days. That's all the longer it took in there, and then they shipped us to uh, to Philadelphia. And then, oh, I don't know, there may have been 50 of us that went from directly from mm -hmm. Tuscaloosa to... Uh, to Philadelphia, so we got in there, no problem, and we were barracks there in the uh, the old dormitories, I and mean, the old beautiful colonial buildings and all that have had their dormitories in there. They mm -hmm. aren't, aren't like barracks at all. They each have an individual room for. I think we had eight in our particular setup. But later on, there were only two of us to a room, two of us to smaller rooms. It was mm -hmm. just a great, great setup actually there. And I learned so much, and Phil and I got again with this writing stuff I did. I wrote a little piece about. The first time I got on a subway and a, and a surface train and all like, you catch the 740 Wissahickon, Wissahickon, change trains at Pennsylvania Station, all that yeah. sort of thing that always, to me, I'd read about in books. And here I was experiencing it. And it was really quite a thrill for a country kid from Bedford. Well, anyway, we got into uh, into these rooms and were assigned to our regular classes. And we attended with some regular classes at the University of Pennsylvania, except mm -hmm. at that time, as you remember, they had the condensed each semester was three month semester instead of a four or four and a half month semester. They condensed the, the mm -hmm. training. You went, you went to school more longer each day and, and mm -hmm. theoretically learned as much in, in three months as you did in, the, in four and a half months under normal, uh, the earlier periods of school. <clears throat> so I started off there and went through the first semester in blaze of glory. I had no problems at all with physics and chemistry and English and all. And, and right, as a matter of fact, uh, I like to say this, I had one. One professor from, we had to write in the, in the English class, we had to write essays and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. I, wrote, I wrote a bit on, well I wrote once on the, this boxcar uh, expedition and all, and then two other things. And I finally got a paper back from him and say, your pen is your fortune, sir, which is to cast no aspersions against your face. <laughs> and I've never forgotten this guy saying that. Well, the first semester went very smoothly and all, and so we started in the second semester and we got to about probably the third, maybe the third week in that second semester, the rumors started to fly that they were going to close up the program. The program they they, 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 got, out, they yeah. got pretty strong, they were going to wipe it out. And of course, they needed they, you for a can of that's, that's exactly what it turned out to be about. And anyway, I went into the first sergeant and asked, well, I'm trained and have a specialty and all, and I transfer back to the Air Corps, I think that's probably what I ought to do now. Mm -hmm. I said, mister, there's only one way you get out of this outfit, you flunk out. I said, thank you, sergeant, you told me all I need to know. <laughs> and believe me, it's, True fact, I just quit studying, quit working. I didn't purposely falsify anything, but I just quit studying chemistry and physics and that sort of thing I wouldn't work on. And I did flunk out at the end of the second, oh. the second semester. And two weeks after I flunked out, everybody went to the industry. Oh. Two weeks. That's another thing I think, thank God, he was looking after me. Flunking out of ASTP was the finest thing that happened. Because <laughs> they were all, they were, went and sent over to train for the infantry. Yeah, for the infantry. For the infantry. Yeah, that's and what that's, happened. That's where I would have been, even though especially training in the air. Yeah. So you, uh, you got a better assignment by flunking out. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Okay. 
Well, I went back then to, from, from there I was shipped to uh, Goldsboro. Again, you talk about that moving around. I was shipped to Goldsboro, North Carolina. And that again was to be classified for classification. Well, this time it was classification where the shooting was. So anyway, I was assigned from uh, Goldsboro to go overseas. Uh -huh. And again, not having any idea which way I would go, of course, uh, getting the order that after, I guess, about four or five days, I was there in Goldsboro. And I was assigned to uh, uh, Pacific, Pacific area. Yeah. So again, after three or four days there, and then I got Did a... Did you know you were assigned to Pacific? I, I knew it there, and at, at Goldsboro, oh. yeah. I knew it both because they had to ship me out and send me to the right place. So that's where yeah. I learned in Goldsboro. That I, was ordered, I didn't wear in Pacific, but yeah. I knew I'd be assigned to the Pacific area. Mm -hmm. So I got a 10-day delay en route there to get from there to Kearns, Utah. And uh, got 10 days at home then with the folks. Here we are, shipping you across the country. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Exactly. Okay. And then there, there I get them a story about the box car. Oh. Okay. About the freight car, I mean the passenger car that went wrong. So I got home, spent 10 days at, at home, then went to Chicago. I went to Indianapolis, got the train there, and then from there we went to Chicago. And then boarded a train in Chicago. The oh. train had gas lights. It looked like one of these uh, the western oh. western movies where they show oh, the yeah. trains going across the prairie. It looked like they, one of those. They cars. hold all those cars they out. All those cars out. And one person asked the conductor. I'm sitting right there. And he said, conductor said, how old is this car we're on? Son, I've been on this route 41 years, and I could never remember when they ever used a car like this. Oh, and my. that's what we rode all the way across the country. No, with no the gas lights. Sitting up with the gas lights. I mean, they didn't use them, Bob. They, they electrified it with that yeah. for, for this purpose. Bob, the, the old gas lights were, they, were uh, still there. Were they uh, just, uh, they weren't sleepers or anything? No, 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 no sleepers. They were just we sat up all the way across the country. Just sat up, yeah. Just curl up and do the best you could. In those, okay. In those seats. <laughs> But anyway, this guy said, 41 years on the line, I never can remember seeing a car like this. Uh -huh. Anyway, we a got a wooden, It was a wooden car? Wooden car. Everything yeah. was wooden. Yeah, all wooden car. No, yeah. Of course, there were metal parts to it, but it was all... Yeah. As I say, it looked a lot like the one in the old Western movies where they yeah, saw the train going across. With the slats the down the side. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> well, anyway, we painted green. I don't remember the color of them, but I wouldn't be surprised when it had... But they, they had a blackout? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, even, blackout. even then, even out of Chicago. Even now, Scott, we were supposed oh. to keep, keep things dark at night. Across, yeah. the, <coughs> across the prairies, as you well remember, they were, they were scared even clear back then as what could happen. Yeah, did they, uh, yeah, what route did you follow? We went, I, I just know we went as direct as we could go. I don't remember. I, I know we went through certain towns and all. Well, we, we ended up in, U in Kern, Utah, south of Salt Lake City. That was our okay. original destination because, again, that was the classification point to decide which, which outfit I Okay. So Kearns, Utah was as I said, south of Salt Lake City, and we were there probably less than a week when we were in Kearns. Mm -hmm. And then from Kearns, and I was given the assignment that I would go to the 307th Bond Group in the 13th Air Force. So I knew that. that means 307th Bond, Bond Group in the 13th Air Force. Okay. And then when I got there, I was assigned the 372nd Squadron. So the 372nd Squadron, 307th Bond Group, 13th Air Force. Uh huh. So that, that was unknown, and then uh, I'd say left, probably no more than a week we were at Kearns. We were shipped out for a Camp Stoneman south of San Francisco. This was the San Francisco then we were shipped out for. That's where, that's where I went. Were Go you ahead. at Stoneman too? Yeah. Oh, okay, well I, apparently that was, uh, that was a shipping big, big shipping point out of there at that time. Anyway, we were there long enough to get processed and ready to go. But a little incident of what happened while I was at Stoneman, my brother was a, a naval officer. He was an executive officer on an LCI, a landing craft infantry. Oh. And I had the last letter I'd had from him, he was in New York, that we're sailing around the, uh, uh, the Horn, we're going to come up to, uh, I thought, San Francisco. He was coming up, this wasn't his writing. My folks had called me, I guess, and said he'd written. And he was going to go from there up to San Francisco. Well, here I was in Stoneman and had some nights off, of course, had three or four nights we were there, we were able to go into San Francisco. Yeah. So I decided I was going to spend my night off finding my brother in the San Francisco Harbor. Yeah. So I spent, took two buddies with me and wasted the whole good night when we could have been doing all kinds of good things so in San Francisco, walking up down the harbor looking for his LCI. Oh. Well, I learned months later, he wasn't in San Francisco, he was in San Diego. Oh. <laughs> so, so, so I wasted that night and I could have had on the town in San Francisco. You know, something I'm, we're going to forget here if we don't get it now. Tell us about well, who was, what, what was your, did, did you have how many brothers or 
where they, did they wind up in the service too? No, I have two brothers. One is two years older than I was. He's deceased now. Yeah. Two years older and then one who's 14 years younger. Okay. And so he was only six at the time, so he wasn't in the oh, service. My, older, in my service. older brother wasn't okay. in the service. Well, go ahead. Matter of fact, Bob, I'll uh, cover that story here for a moment. My older brother was playing on the Purdue Big Ten Championship team in 1940. That was named by the Open Road for Boys as the All American team. So theoretically, he was an All American at Purdue in 1940. And Football? Then, no, no, basketball. Basketball. Yeah, okay. Uh, remember, we grew up in Southern Indiana. This was basketball. Okay. Anyway, he what they did then, Bob, and this is again kind of a side note, but Tony Hinkle, remember the great coach from Buffalo? Yeah. Well, Tony went to the Great Lakes and coached the Great Lakes basketball teams that were regarded as the world champion basketball team. Yeah. And he had them play one year. They went in as enlisted men, played one year, and oh. gave them their commissions. And they go out, and the next bunch of all Americans would come in and play for a year. Anyway, Charlie played his basketball one year and then was commissioned and went into uh, uh, yeah. sea duty. Went into sea duty. Okay. So anyway, they had one brother, back. a naval officer, and one who was only six years old. Yeah. Right. We're back at Camp Stoneman. Okay, we got out of there then after a period of time, of course, and got on to a Liberty ship in San Francisco. You went down, went down to? Went down to, down to the docks in San Francisco. You went uh, went down on a ferry boat down to? Down, that's right. I'd forgotten about the ferry boat yeah. down to, what are they called? They have a name, Bob. The, the docks down there have a I don't remember what it was, man. They had a, and like the Stockington docks or something like that. I don't remember. Well, you get on the ferry boat. Anyway, get on the ferry boat. You got to go down and get on your ship. On the ship, that's exactly okay. Right. And your, your and ship. Loaded on there. Of course, this was a remember the old Kaiser Kaiser built Liberty ships. Yeah. And this was the uh, the William I don't remember the name the William S. Black, the name of the ship. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were not in, we're not in the Congo. We were on our own. Mm -hmm. and of course, it was a fast fast ship, faster than the. Uh, most anything the Japanese were able to mm -hmm. chase us with, and we zigzagged across there. And I think it was, I think it was 15 days. It took us 15 mm -hmm. days then to to uh, get to our first first port, first point. But I'll never. This was New Maya, New Caledonia. That, that yeah, today still New Maya, New Maya, New Caledonia. You still got that crossword puzzle. Yeah, once yeah a I bet you do. <laughs> I'm not. I never was smart enough to work crossword puzzles, but I can believe it. That would be one of them. But we came in. Go ahead. You, uh, how long did it take you to get across? It was 15 days. Okay. Uh, what do you remember from your <laughs> right well, on the The main thing that I remember more than anything else, well, first of all, we crossed the equator and they had a piddle and dab, a ceremony, you know, as we went across. Yeah, and all a silly and thing. And holler and all that. Bit, but, man, there were too many troops and, of course, by ourselves. And how many of were on board? I, I really don't remember the number, Bob. Oh, it was, oh. We were piled. One right on top of the other in the hammocks down in the, in the yeah. hole and all. And I, I won't even guess, but I think there were maybe 1,500. Uh -huh. But anyway, the ship was full because it was not yeah. a big ship, but it was still yeah. wasn't big enough for that. What was the, the you remember uh, the mess hall on oh, the ship? I, I got seasick one one meal, the first meal on board there. I, I didn't want to eat anything. I didn't, uh -huh. From then on, I didn't have any problem with it at all. But we had the big problem, we had to go down, the galley was down underneath, or down in the yeah. The, the hole, it wasn't up where you'd get fresh air and all that. First night, I didn't, didn't have anything to eat at all, but from then on, I handled it all right, all the way across. Anyway, we came in New Maya Harbor, and my recollection of that is as vivid today almost as it can be. But you remember the song, Sleep in Lagoon, and Stars Over the Campus, and those songs oh. about the stars? Oh. And I looked up in that sky, we were out in the harbor, and the lights of New, of New Caledonia were over in the distance, and all that. And the stars above, there were millions and millions, and I never, ever in my life, seen stars yeah. like those. I sat there and really just uh, sucked it all in. The beauty oh. of that side never to this day have forgotten it. The, um, the, uh, when you when you got to, uh, you, you say you didn't have a convoy. I didn't know those ships were fast enough. They, for that's that. what I understand. As a matter of fact, they, were, they told us that and I had to believe them. That they were fast enough that they could oh. go they would send them over by themselves. I mean, as yeah. long as they took precautionary measures. And of course, I'm sure they were kept track of by the you know people, yeah. the uh, naval forces all knew where they were all the time. They yeah. track all those ships, and we were not in any convoy at all. We were entirely on our own. Uh -huh. So anyway, trusting a, a good captain. Or, Did you see you know, any? Uh, didn't see. I didn't see a sign of any other. Ever see any other ships never, at all? Never saw another ship. So there were people that were uh, probably in it. A lot of the ships in the convoy, only you didn't see them. That, that's possible, no, but never saw a ship. Uh -huh. Never, 
accidents and okay. all the way across. And never encountered any, never had any alerts or anything that sort. Yeah. To our knowledge, now maybe the of course you had blackout, blackout. Oh, absolutely, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. blackout all the time. Did you play cards on the? Yeah, play cards and wrote a bit, read a bit. Did they have a library on the? They had a library. Had a good library on board. Yeah, they had on lots the board. of books on board. Mm -hmm. What was board. your rank at this time? I was a private. Okay. Oh, I all the way up to. I hadn't even made BFC because I had been, become a BFC if I'd gone gone direct on the line, though, but I didn't. I went into STP instead, so I was still a private. Oh, oh. Yeah. So uh, anyway, my my discharge says my highest rank was aviation cadet, which is technically true, but actually you'll see when I get into this dress up here pretty soon. I was a buck sergeant, but I always said I outranked Colonel. I was a buck sergeant. Oh, okay, go ahead. Well, anyway, we got into uh, New Mexico, New Caledonia, and unloaded there. I mean, remember unloaded. everything about the harbor pulling in? I can remember just, we, we of course, went in in small ships. The mm -hmm. liberty ship couldn't go all the way up to the uh, to the way we, we embarked. Just had to disembark. Didn't have to order rope ladders and that sort of thing. They had a gangplank flight down to the smaller boats. Mm -hmm. We well, went well, the smaller boats to the... Oh, well, you got on yeah, small. we got on smaller boats to me. Uh, the ship oh, didn't land. We went in the smaller boats. They ferried you in. Ferried us into the... Okay. Into the uh, harbors. The lighters, you mean. That. That in, yeah, that's right. Anyway, no problem at all. That was very routine. We got off and then went out to, uh, not very far out of town, actually, to where, we, where the encampment was. Now, here again, that was a distribution point. Like you said, a lot of them moved from place to place. This was a distribution point. Mm -hmm. So we were there, I think, two weeks, maybe. We was this uh, a big city? Or? No, 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 I wanted to get to that. New Caledonia was a... A French city, primarily, but there were all kinds of nationalities there. It's very cosmopolitan area, and mm -hmm. you know, all the way from uh, natives there to native kind French. Of like native South Pacific. Pacific. Very much like the South Pacific, yeah. Oh, okay. Exactly, very much like that. Anyway, the uh, then beautiful. It sat on a hillside, and all you see up the hills were the uh, some very large, uh, like Riviera yeah. plantations, all from the sides of the hills, and all directly mm -hmm. then downtown was. Strictly business district, but not not big buildings at all. Most of them were play adobe downtown, even, mm -hmm. even though they were nice and represented a, a lot of a lot of wealth in that area. I mean, they still were uh, were adobe buildings, and, mm -hmm. and uh, so we were there about three weeks. I think we were no, it wasn't that long. We were there maybe a week and a half, I guess. Again, waiting to be assigned to uh, to get into the real war, yeah. and uh, so that we were. I made my first move out of there then, and all places I went to Nuka to uh, Guadalcanal. My first assignment was Guadalcanal. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't know enough about that area. You brought a map here. Maybe you can kind of show us. I can pick it up. We can see where, where we are here. Yeah. I can see upside down. Can you pick that up, Mike, you think? Sure. Let me zoom in a little bit. Now, the, uh, the black is... Uh, now, the black is what the Japanese still occupied, even... See, these stripes are where, where the Allies had moved in. And the black is where the Japanese were still occupied. Now, Guadalcanal is in the Solomon Islands, which is right down here. It says Solomon somewhere down there. Anyway, it's right down this, this general, New Guinea here I am, right here. Solomon Islands is right in here. In this area right here. See that, Bob? Mm -hmm. Okay, the Solomon Islands of Guadalcanal, then would be just about in here where my finger is, would be Guadalcanal. Uh -huh. And then most of the area that I was involved with the entire time was right around the circle like, like this. We ended up then up north of, of New Guinea, about in here in the Halmahera group, up in the, the Low Lady, but still up at the top of the, the Solomon group, and the, what was known as the Halmaheras on the island of Moritai. That comes later. That comes four or five moves later. Mm -hmm. And anyway, Guadalcanal was right down in here off of New Guinea in the Solomon Islands, about here. So there's the whole whole layout. Yeah. And then here is Borneo, over which we got one of those ribbons. is a blue presidential citation ribbon for, for bombing all the way from here over to here, which again I'll discuss later. But theoretically, it was longer than a B-24 could stay in the air. Mm -hmm. Our group stayed in the air, flew over and dropped their bombs and came back. That's where we lost the third of the third of the group were lost over or Barneo. Okay. So we came to uh, got into Guadalcanal. And there there was a rough landing. I mean, the 
landing there, we had to go off there and tenders too, because the ships couldn't come in the Little Canal, but we had to get into the little, just almost rafts is what they were. But when we came in, they had a floating dock and a floating ship, and we had to carry, we all had our duffel bags, we had yeah. duffel bags, and they throw, had to throw that duffel bag over first and then follow it over. And oftentimes, some of the fellows would, nobody ever fell in, at least, but by golly, you're afraid you might, because yeah. the dock was going one way and the ship was going another, and there was a space sometimes about this big you had to step across. Uh -huh. A little bit of a lurch, and you were lucky to fall onto the on yeah. the dock side instead of back onto the ship side. Anyway, Guadalcanal, and I was assigned to, as I said, well, I was assigned to the 372nd Bomb Squadron of the 307th Bomb Group of the 13th Air Force. Okay. And my first experience, one thing that I might read to you here, really, was I, it's so much better here because I wrote this at the time, the night or so after it happened, I wrote this down. My first experience in. With this was really written, being this was written back. This was written on June the 15th, 1944. As you got American Red Cross mm -hmm. stationery. That's right. By golly, I have, haven't I? I didn't realize yeah. that. My American Red Cross stationery. That was uh, American Red Cross did a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. Well, go ahead and read to it. Okay, it says, I view Guadalcanal from the air. Two o'clock on a hot Wednesday afternoon found us calling into Coley Point Tower. From the south end of that field, single landing strip, asking for a clear runway in order that we might get our mighty B-24 bomber into the air for a test hop. The request was granted, and we thundered down the steel matting that took the place of concrete in the combat zone, and used the quarter of the strip, gaining the momentum necessary to raise the heavy craft from the ground. The moment the climb was started, one could tell that one's man's invasion of nature on that South Pacific island of Guadalcanal was fairly well on the offensive. Had the same area been viewed a few short months earlier, practically the entire visible object, object would have been the green tops of the thick, formidable jungle vegetation and the tall blades of innumerable passes of swamp grass, but not so on the day of our takeoff. Instead, this mass of green was intermittently dotted with clearings and they housed tents, large thatch huts, and supplies. Away to the south, even cultivation of the soil was in evidence, where American soldiers were busy turning some areas into enterprising farm patches. We headed our nose toward the sea, and from my position in the top gun turret, I could look out across the scene of many ferocious battles and see the rugged outline of Tulagi Island just as across the bar over to the west. The Blue Pacific that day seemed as though she was attempting to show everyone interested just how she got her name, for the quiet, peaceful waters seemed to spread like a smooth carpet across the islands in the area, disturbed only by trailing backwash of the many vessels of war that challenged her composure. Passing above Kearney Airstrip, and over the, passing over Carney Airstrip and over the water, we swing back to the south, bringing in view, into view Henderson Field, Lunga Beach, and the unforgettable sight of crosses row and row that mark our place. In this area, we saw new palm trees rising in the stubble, and thousands of dead ones shot away with the fire of our invading Allied forces and the defending Japanese garrison. But not the trees alone stopped the many valleys, for that, undetermined, for that underneath each cross that made up that block of almost solid white from the air. So thick were they, they lived as American soldiers, your friends and mine, who gave, and no, let's not talk about that. Just before a sudden squall shut in around my glass dome, I could see a few miles inland to the east. The string of hills that was in the entire length of the island, which, offended, which offered good refuge for the natives to move their wives and daughters to, and the not always food-hungry Americans and New Zealand forces moved in. At that time, the ship had been put through its paces, and we couldn't stay up right all night sightseeing for her, so we had a date at dawn the next morning. So with a quick swing back into the wind and a bit of a drop, we put our wheels once again on the terra firma. Yeah, I wrote that right, yeah. right after I came home. Okay, not much. Many of us have got anything left that we wrote. Well, I did uh, write it. I've got a whole well, bunch of Mark, uh, Mark uh, the, the, your... Uh, you mentioned there are some other troops. Were, were you beginning to well, see other uh, nationalities? And were, yes. You, said, you mentioned New Zealand. We, we, were, we were with the Australians almost all the time. There were Aussie troops always on the, about every island we were on, the Aussie troops were on, but that was all. There weren't other, other that is not quite right. The uh, Gurkhas, remember the, the Indian fighters. Gurkha, the Gurkhas yeah. and the Indian, you were in that area too. The, the Indians, the Gurkha Indians were also on, on that group. But other than the Australians, in terms of massive groups of troops, the Australians really were the only ones that we were around. Uh -huh. So in, anyway, the uh, Guadalcanal, even though this was much late after the invasion, after the real rough stuff and all that I was there, 
but they were still Japanese troops. I mean, back in the oh. in the uh, in the island, they were not eliminated or wiped out. They were just neutralized and gotten back oh. when they couldn't couldn't do anything to you. Uh -huh. So okay. we we stayed on Guadalcanal then not too long a time actually from Guadalcanal and then we moved up to Las Negras Island again along that same same group of Solomons into the house into the uh, Las Negras Island. I've got again, I won't read it, but it's a little involvement. Again, one of the things that I wrote down while I was there was taking a walk along the beach. Oh. And the beauty of the, the sea sea life and all that. The, yeah. the waves would come up again in the ocean and wash out and there'd be these little ponds of, of exotic fish and all that left there. Yeah. And, uh, and one, I remember one uh, clam I'd always heard as a kid were some clams, you know, that, that eat, eat a man. Of course, they didn't actually eat them at all, but were big enough to. Oh. And I came upon this time I wrote about it, I came upon a, a clam, a clam shell about this big around that had serrated, uh, a serrated shell, of course long empty, the yeah. clam was long gone within it, but, but I realized, and I think I said in what I'd written, that, that a five or six year old kid could have curled up inside of, a, of that clam shell. Oh. I didn't dream they made them, but anyway, what I, what I described mainly was the beauty, the azure blues and the bright reds yeah. and all of those fish. I could go to the store now and pay to buy those tropical fish there. There were like millions and millions yeah. along that shoreline of Las Negras Island. And Las Negras, again, like every island we were on, frankly, every island we were on except one. The island walked in, I'll tell you why in a minute, we didn't well, now, have any Japanese there. Well, Mark, you're, are you flying? You flying? No, I, I, fl I flew test tops, that's all I flew by. I didn't fly on, any, on a crew. Oh. The ground mechanics would often go along when your airplane was yeah. you changed an engine and did something, you'd fly the airplane to test and be okay. sure it was working all right. So oftentimes the ground mechanic would go along, sometimes just for the ride, that's all I was doing here, just going along oh. for the ride. And sometimes so I would fly as an engineer and, and uh, call off the, the mileage to the pilot and yeah. start the, the putt putt, what you call the, the generator on board and all that sort of thing there. But that was only for, only for test stops. Yeah. But uh, did you, did you, uh, uh, did you get? Did you go out with any of the, any of them on a test top when, when you got shot at? Then never, no, no, never, any, never did. <laughs> never did. We got shot at, and these about 200 plus bomb raids that I went through were strictly two or three planes at a time. The gaps, you know, they were so neutralized, close enough to us that we didn't have to worry about nearly every day, and sometimes twice a night they'd send over a bunch to, to strafe the harbors where we were or yeah. to, to drop bombs on the, on the personnel, mainly on the, the aircraft oh. and the airfields, what they tried to do. But, but I lived with a, a foxhole right next to me on Moratai for nearly a year. We were with a foxhole there and we would, in the early, in the beginning, we'd always rush out to get into that foxhole when we heard the alert go off. But we oh. soon learned that depending on how, how far away the noise was before we'd get up out of bed and go out there to the foxhole. Oh. Oh. So that uh, your your exposure to Japanese uh, the Japanese uh, fire uh, planes was was by strafing and well, strafing bomb, and bombing. That's bombing. right. My first one was the, were those raids at night or once in a while they come over in the daytime. Uh -huh. Usually when they did, they were strafing the ports and the ships. And, but that that fire would sometimes come over into into the camp area because we were not uh -huh. that far away from there. But the first air raid I went through was in on Las Negras Island, and I, and I remember it again vividly. I was walking, I'd been over someplace else visiting, was walking back to my tent, and the noise started. And boy, I grabbed to the ground, nearly ate dirt, laying down there. But what I was scared of was our own guns. I didn't, oh. I didn't know that, of course, until the next day. But all that racket wasn't Japanese dropping it bombs. Was. The Japanese were up there dropping bombs, but what I heard was that ack ack from our own ground guns, and it was so loud it was just deafening. That noise. It was the first time I'd ever heard it, but we survived. You were sleeping in tents. Sleeping in tents. Yeah, everything never had until we got. There. Matter of fact, when we got back to Luzon, when the war ended, we still still were in tents, big building in tents back yeah. in the Fort Stockenberg. And what about Luzon. the uh, uh, tropical diseases and that sort of thing? Malaria was the only thing that we. Really was rampant, Bob. Again, it wasn't. I don't mean everyone had, but we all took Adderin for, for malaria. I mean, oh. every, everyone that had any sense took his Adderin as a preventative. Oh. And I never got malaria at all. Never had any. Never had any tropical. He said, "Well, I take that back. I had fungus. I still today I don't have don't have toenails on some of my toes was a, a fungus from the fungus. fungus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, won't that, take my shoes off to show you. But. <laughs> was that uh, pretty common? Very common. 
Yeah. Very common. Uh, a lot of fellows never did re recover from that. Uh, well, I didn't really. I had one big toenail that completely had to be surgically removed on, and the other uh -huh. all fungus, fungus nails. Uh -huh. But again, that wasn't that wasn't enough to get me disability discharged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it does affect your uh, uh, the walking though. Oh, absolutely. To some extent, yeah. 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 It really does. Okay. Uh, well, Mark, uh, uh, what's your rank now? Well, I'm up to uh, PSC. Right. Yeah, PSC okay. then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I didn't make Buck Sergeant until oh, about three months before the war ended. It took me a long time to get up there. <laughs> oh. So okay. I, I was PSC, I made PSC for then. But I hadn't been assigned yet to uh, a regular crew. And, and, uh, and luck, well, I take that back, I'd already moved to Las Vegas. I was assigned to to a particular crew when I got to, yeah. to Las Negros. Yeah. And then uh, from there we moved on up from there to... But what happened, Bob, we, we were known as the Jungle Air Force. And we moved in literally, I mean, we moved in almost right behind the entry. About as soon as they got a room for, cleared off for an airstrip, and we moved in, and, and the entry pushed the Japanese on back further into the oh. islands, and we move in and oh. we'll start flying off in there. So the engineers went there, of course, and, and oftentimes, of course, they used the Japanese airstrip that were already built of course, blown up yeah. in the park, and they had to reconstruct them and make them into yeah. in American airfields. Okay. Uh, did uh, now when they were con uh, constructing these air airplanes, I suppose you had a lot of engineers that were with you. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> well, they weren't with us, but they were there ahead of time. Okay. And they, they, they went in. They went in with big bulldozers. And, yeah. Yeah. And uh, clear out the jungle. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh now. You know, a lot of us have never really been in the jungle. Huh. Tell us about a well, South, a jungle that South had, Pacific jungle. A jungle it? that hadn't been shot up of is beautiful. Yeah. They're exotic birds. Uh -huh. I slept with lizards every night. I mean, you know, that just commonplace. You brush, uh -huh. you brush the lizards, and you know, these little lizards about this big. You, you brush the lizards off your bunk before you climb in, and your, your little canvas cot uh -huh. before you climb in there. But anyway, they're absolutely beautiful. As a matter of fact, uh, shame facially in a way, but that's the only thing I ever used my gun for to shoot at was, was some of those birds when I go back into the jungle. I took my gun really because the Japanese were still back in there, but I didn't, I didn't expect to see any of them at all, and I never did. But uh -huh. anyway, I would go back and, and shoot at birds and uh, some of the wildlife. But and the other thing too that I can remember so vividly is the orchids were just like wildfires over there, uh -huh. just like wildfires. But if any, the, the jungle was a thing of beauty, really. What kind of... Uh Trees, or you know, we've been, we're used to oaks and yeah, mostly and palm trees. Palm, um, yeah, almost um, entirely palms. That was the thing that when you're going, well, the next move, I'll, I'll move ahead then off Las, Las Negras because I've gotten the first first air raid and bombing attack over with there, but there was nothing very eventful that happened there. We uh -huh. were there for about three weeks, I think, and then we moved up to the island of Wapti, which had been taken by the while we were on Las Negras, they had just taken Wapti, and mm -hmm. Wapti was an island. That Really, not much bigger than the. We, our our airstrip ran from water to water. That's how big the island was uh -huh. at that particular area. And the trees, the palm trees, and all were just nothing but about stood at this high anywhere. Everything just totally wiped out. And uh -huh. The rock base, of course, there was no beauty of anything there at all anymore. So it went from palm trees, standing palm trees, beautiful palm trees, into into stubble that once had been bombed over. And, uh, What's that? Well, how about the the, uh, the climate? It was not all that bad, Bob. It was hot, of course, hot as a dick, but it was not all that bad. As a matter of fact, I was taking a shower the other day and just thought, and I don't know why the recollection came back, but I remember taking our showers over there. We had to put up, just put up big tanks up, build an area to put up a big tank, you know, with the water running down, yeah. and gravity force down into our showers. And normally when you take a shower, it was cold. Because by that time the sun had gone down, the, what, yeah. I don't mean bitter cold like freezing or anything yeah. like that, but it was 50 chilly. degrees or so and it was chilly to take a shower. And mm -hmm. you always had to take your shower after you got in off the line, no matter what time it was, you wanted to take a shower. You had to take a shower and get cold. Yeah. So anyway, that was my recollection of, of that. Well, go ahead and tell us about you. Well, we moved up from Las Negras to, to Wapti, this, which was literally a rock. We took off and we, uh, well, what occasionally, this wasn't unusual for Wapti, but we'd occasionally lose an airplane landing or taking off because they wouldn't, mm -hmm. wouldn't quite get get the lift right and they'd go into the drink because there was water on, on each side. Matter of fact, we lost an air, one of the aircraft that I was 
was assigned to was lost on takeoff one time when it went down and into the, into the ocean. None of the crew, none of the crew got out. But anyway, we uh, were on Wapdi, and Wapdi Island was uh, one that they moved in so fast. I say, well, we were on Las Negras about three weeks before they had just taken Wapdi Mumma, so there were uh, motorcycles and all kinds of war souvenir stuff to be to be gathered. The first ones that got there, and uh, a few of our outfit were there in time. And one you mean the, Japanese? Japanese equipment, no, no, motorcycles, Left and, and, and trucks and cars and all that. They normally try to destroy it, but they didn't always get it get it done. So there was something. What there. was? Oh, well, what were uh, were there Toyotas? And no, no, nothing like that. Bob. There wasn't anything. Uh, wasn't anything. Motorcycles. The only uh, okay. and big and military trucks. Military trucks and motorcycles. What? Uh, and I don't remember what kind of trucks they were. Uh -huh. But the, the motor. As a matter of fact, my buddy I mean, and I, I, Thompson. I wonder if any of the, the names that we see today. Are I, you know, I, of course, I didn't yeah. get that thought at the time. Fuji or you know, what? But, now today, you know, we'd be conscious of that, but I wasn't yeah. at that time. Uh -oh. It was just, it was just the Japanese. Well, of there. course, you remember when, but when the, a good a good part of our equipment was Studebaker. Oh, sure. And, That's uh, right. In, uh, in the South, law. South Bend Studebaker. Yeah. yeah. They, uh, they had furnished an awful lot of the trucks. Yeah. Uh, well, did, uh, did you see any American equipment, uh, Studebakers down there? No, I don't remember. I, I, um, I wasn't conscious. Of I was. Them. I was conscious. Of, yeah, well, I um, maybe should have been, but I wasn't. In, uh, in those days. Well, tell us some more of your story. Well, we're coming up from uh, Wapdi then. Not you know, uh, Mark, I'm not. I'm not catching some of these. Uh, these names are exotic names. Oh, Why okay. don't you well, tell us about what? Well, Wapdi, W-A-K-D-E. Wapdi Island, W-A-K-D-E, Wapdi, Wapdi Island, Walk the Island. Okay. Yeah, that was again the upper part of the Solomon, Solomon group. So what is happening here is New, New Guinea, I never never laid foot on New Guinea, but I could have swam to it from two of our islands, on the, mm -hmm. said, and a large part of it Japanese occupied. There's no further away than an arm, a good, long, strong rowboat, and row mm -hmm. in a rowboat, or a strong enough swimmer even could have swam to New Guinea. From some of the islands we were on, but they were neutralized and that's what we were. Once, were in a while, once in a while they choose some artillery fire over on the island, uh, very seldom were they able to, to do it. Anyway, Wapti is W-A-K-D-E, and then the next one that I'll have to take a moment to spell, we moved from Wapti to Numfor. Numfor is N-O-E-M-F-O-O-R, Numfor, N-O-E-M-F-O-O-R. And Numfor, here again, same thing. The strip that the engineers had gotten in had just been taken. The engineers had gotten in and built an airstrip. Of course, the metal, metal uh, strips that they laid down oh. very quickly. Then built the airstrip, and the jungle was still. Back there. As a matter of fact, the natives hadn't even gotten their families moved back away from the American soldiers yet. They were still. Over, oh. uh, matter of fact, every day when I went from from our camp, my tent, to the airstrip, I passed the native village, oh. and they were all. You could see them just plain as day. Matter of fact. They called me peroxide, Bob. I had the nickname peroxide in the That's native. They called because they used peroxide on their hair and it turned it red. Uh -huh. They all had red hair because of the peroxide effect on, the, on their head to kill the lice, to kill the, kill the uh, bugs in their head. Kill the what? Kill the lice in their head. That's what oh. they used for lice control was, was peroxide. And it turned their hair red. And so I was called peroxide by the natives. Did, <laughs> did you experience any of those lice? Uh, no, no, I never, never got any, never got any at all. But it's very common among the natives. Yeah. And they were, they used, I say they used it as a preventative. Did you get to know any of the natives? No, no, never did. I talked to some of them, you know, pidgin oh. English, but they would, they would speak, but I never got to know any of them. No, they were, it was off limits for us to get in. We were not supposed to go near the villages. Yeah. Mainly because they didn't want us to. The natives didn't want us to. Uh -huh. And I don't mean they didn't, some people did. Were they? Were but I talked, but they, they would be down along the strip, the airstrip and all that. Were they using the natives to do yeah, they, work? Yeah, they did, did some work. They were, they were used for some work. Yeah, but normally not very much because they were they were ready to get back away from the troops. They wanted to get back yeah. into the hills. Were they uh, French speaking or English speaking? Uh, neither. They spoke their own their own language. Oh, okay. So you're moving again. You're moving away from yeah. the populated part. The French and all that's long gone. You're into there are some towns in there that I'm sure were. French or others, and I never was in any of them or near any of them. Any of them. But the natives would move back into the, in the thick of the jungle to get away from the troops. All right. 
Why don't we pause a little bit? Okay. Okay. Bob says I know where I left off. I guess I'm going to see if I do know where I left off. But we got to know them for know them for Island and again, as I say, the, the natives were back in the still still down close to the strip and, and at that time. And this is when we uh, uh, had the assignment to carry out a, a B-24 bomb strike longer than theoretically a B-24 could stay in the air. And this is a takeoff from Noonpur Island to Dalek Papan, which is in Dutch Borneo. And that's where the oil fields, the Japanese oil fields were located. As uh, Germany has Palesti, if you remember, the yeah. well, this was, this was a, the, the Japanese Palesti was in Dalek Papan. Okay. Anyway, we took off what we did, Bob. We took the B-24 has four bomb bays. We took out two, emptied two of those bomb bays and put gasoline in, gasoline tanks and only had bombs in two bomb bays. And the extra gasoline, of course, would be able to fly further. But theoretically, this was a mission of more miles, more time in the air, than the B-24 was supposed to be able to stay in the air. Uh -huh. Anyway, our crew, our gang took off, and the, the 307th bomb group, along with one other 13th Air Force bomb group, uh -huh. bombed out of Japan. And they took off and got the, the mission done, but almost one-third, full one-third of our crews never got back. And some of them actually didn't. They got, got back, but they couldn't land them. So low on gasoline, they had to ditch in the ocean instead of getting around the, to the strip. And I don't think, to my recollection, I don't think we lost anybody. They were all able to, to ditch safely. If they did get back to that point and get picked up, but uh, but it was. When you speak of one third of them lost, how many would that? Amount? That would have been. Uh, there were probably uh, about 16 planes out of our squadron on there. So that made about five of them. Or how many men? There were 10 men to a crew. So, so there were uh, 160 uh, people yeah, and, and uh, lost. About, 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 well, out of the two groups, yeah, about 150 or so would have been. Uh, been were, they, were they heard of or what? No, no, and to my knowledge, the, the friends I had anyway, several of the crews that I knew and all that, nothing was ever heard of. Them. They were down, never, never, they wouldn't have been captured because they'd have been out in the water and all, they'd have been shot down trying to bail out or kill them in the crash. Uh -huh. So anyway, that was, we got a presidential unit citation of the second one that the group got. And again, when I get put on my put on output of there pretty soon, this presidential unit citation is a separate group okay. that our group had to, had one bronze star because we had one on Truck Island and one for our ballot for Pan. Oh. Anyway, we're on Noon for we move along here, Bob. We're on Noon for we conducted that mission. It was very successful in spite of the severe loss because it, it did cut down on the oil supply of the Japanese. Then we moved up to Noomphor to Moratai, that's M-O-R-A-T-A-I, Moratai mm -hmm. Island. And that's up in the very northernmost part of what they call the Halmahera group. And we went in, we were there for nearly a year, and one reason we were there that long, which I'll get to in a moment, was the fact that we, uh, we were, well, I'll wait a moment on that. We, we got into Moratai, and Moratai we set up a rather permanent camp. We still mm -hmm. had tents, lived in tents, but some of the fellows would build themselves a a wood floor or deck and all, so they'd be up off the ground, but uh, I didn't, I never did, the ones I was in with, but it was a pretty good land we were on, it wasn't jungly at all, we were in the jungle, but I mean, we'd clear out ourselves a place to put our uh, our tents and put our uh, bunks down. We were about a mile away from the airstrip, we had to go a mile or so, and I rode this motorcycle that a friend of mine, Japanese motorcycle that a friend of mine had confiscated, we'd ride back and forth to, to the strip. But one other story about Moratai, again, we went ahead getting almost daily bombings, and that's when we dug our foxholes and had them there, so if we mm -hmm. felt we had to, we'd go out and get in the foxhole overnight. Again, I never was in any big, big dangers. It turned out the bombs that dropped and the shells that were shot and all were far enough away from me that I never was in danger, but I would occasionally take my, bee, my carbine rifle and go back into the, into the uh, jungle, which was still the infantry patrolled mm -hmm. every day. The Japanese were still way back in there and all, but uh, anyway, I'd go back and hunt birds, like I said a while ago. But out of Moratai then, we uh, were there for, for nearly a year, and one of my stories, anecdotes about that was I ran into a buddy of mine from Bedford who was in the Navy. Oh. And if you know anything about the, uh, the jungle, the islands, all the Air Corps, and all, everybody but the Navy was starving. Don't mean not to death, but anyway, food was hard to come. I mean, we would occasionally chip in, all the whole squadron would chip in and send a plane down to Australia just to buy food and all and on. They'd have to use an excuse to do, to go, they couldn't go to buy food, but they Suppose they go for a park the airplane or something like that, and they buy food while they were there. And we'd eat for three or four days. We'd, we'd eat well, anyway. But the, the point I was getting at, I ran into this Navy buddy of mine from Bedford, so I decided I'd go up and eat with him. The Navy had lots of food. 
I'd go up there about three times a week. I'd get in that chow line and go through the line. After I'd been there for about two weeks, one big old Navy chief came and said, Look, Red, said, you know you don't belong here. Now you go ahead and eat tonight, he said, but don't let me see you back here anymore. And I said, Thank you, Chief. And I went ahead and ate that night, but never, never went back. But he knew I didn't belong. Well, on Martin, when the war was winding down, we were scheduled then to, to move up to uh, uh, Okinawa. Mm -hmm. That was about three months before the war ended. We were to move to Okinawa. Matter of fact, had some planes in the air. I wasn't yet. But we had some planes in the air on the way to Okinawa when the typhoon hit. That's the word I was trying to think of about going on this typhoon. When the typhoon hit Okinawa, and so they, of course we had to turn around and come back, and never did get there. We, mm -hmm. The, the uh, destruction they took Okinawa up. By that time, they cleared an airstrip for us to land on and all, and within oh three or three or four weeks they moved on enough that. We didn't have to go up there, but the reason for Okinawa, that was only uh, O-K-I-N-A-W-A, Okinawa, but that was uh, close enough within 350 miles of Japan, and our purpose, of course, was to go up there and, uh, and uh, bomb Japan from Okinawa. Mm -hmm. We've been bombing Leyte from, uh, from uh, Mordecai. We've been bombing Leyte, L-E-Y-T-E, -E. that's the place where MacArthur waited ashore with the cameras in front of him, and as I understand, they had two or three takes of, of MacArthur waiting ashore there. Huh? But my personal story about MacArthur was on Moratai Island when we were given orders to stand at attention because the general's plane was going to land and refuel and take off and we were to stand at attention no matter where you were. Stand at attention until that plane had landed and been taken off. Well, and I stood go. there beside that airplane and stand at attention. All, and I'm sure that order came with subordinates and all. But anyway, that, I'm showing I admire MacArthur so much as a military man that he, he had an ego that wouldn't quit. I wanted to mention too, because Mike brought it up too about Lindbergh. I never saw on or knew of Lindbergh at all except for uh, the fact he was in the Pacific, but I always admired very much what he did for it, which some people may not know, but he came out and tested planes to try to determine what the best way to be would be to carry out the attack directly on Japan. So he actually spent combat time in uh, not shooting at planes, flying as an observer in the, uh, in the Pacific during the war. And after the, as many of us remember, he was, he was questionable about his attitude toward the Axis. He, oh. he, he really thought maybe the Germans were doing a, not killing people and all, but they may have had the right track in terms of, of their aircraft. That's his main concern, what they were doing with, with aircraft at that time. So anyway, I never saw him. Or was anyway, he was up in the Marianas, which was maybe 2,000 miles north of us. The other person, the famous personality, was Lou Ayers, and I don't think Mike would be old enough to remember him. Lou Ayers, and Bob, you remember yeah, him? He was the better movie, movie actor. Big movie actors of the day, mm -hmm. you know, and he was a conscientious objector. But he said, I will certainly go to, I'll go to war, but I won't kill anybody. Oh, I remember he, he, was, he, was, a he was a medic. He was a medic, and he, he was a medic, he was a and, pacifist. and he was right on the front lines. We heard stories, and he was in, in the general area where I was. Mm -hmm. I never saw him, but he was in that general area. Mm -hmm. Well, we moved ahead in Moratai, then we, we got up on the way to Okinawa and didn't have to go. So we were still on war time when the war ended. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I remember now about the war ending, of course, we were just jubilation because we were, we were glad when it ended in Europe, but we knew it was still a long, hard fight, and, which it would have been without the atomic bomb being dropped. And I was fully in support of the dropping of the bomb. It? Otherwise, it been, including me, it could have meant a lot of people bombed up of American soldiers. But anyway, what I got to see was the surrender of all the Southwest Japanese forces. It was held almost across the street from our camp in the big Australian athletic field over there. And that's, oh, where, that's where the surrender where was. Where was this? This was on Moratai. Okay. Moratai Island. And you saw the surrender? You saw the, I actually observed they put up, a, a, well, they already had them. It was an athletic field. The Australians had built. And they had some bleachers up there. And I sat on the bleachers and watched, oh, probably as far from here to the, to the street. I was that far away. They wouldn't let, you know, the regular troops didn't get up too close. They had to, we had to oh. keep our distance and get around there. So. Anyway, I got to observe the, the Japanese, about a dozen Japanese soldiers came, not in regalia at all, they were in their regular field uniform, but came in, oh. and there was a group of American, not MacArthur and all, but of his, his commanders for the Southwest Pacific area met and, met and accepted the surrender at the table, sitting down just like it shows in the movie, sitting at the table, signing the, signing the papers to surrender oh, all the open. Southwest troops out in an open field, oh. out in an open field down there. We got to go over there. And this was a ceremony arranged. In September, not September the 7th, this was in August. 
the final surrender came September the 2nd on board the Missouri. If you remember, it was when the, the actual surrender, but it was August, I think, 26th or something like that, 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 that the Japanese did surrender. Uh -huh. And it was probably the two or three days later that this, this right. ceremony that I saw took place. Now, and uh, it was just a, a, a small group, though. Well, it's about a dozen Japanese and maybe no more than a dozen Americans. Uh -huh. And probably, oh, there must have been a few hundred of both Australian and, uh, and American soldiers got to, got to observe it. But as I okay. say, we had to keep our distance back from, from that. Before our time gets away, let's put your uniform on. Oh, oh, oh no. <laughs> okay, let's try that. Now, I was telling Mike while to go, see, there are two things involved here. First of all, to show myself that I still get it on, and secondly, I've never had my picture taken in it. It's been, it's never seen the light of day since I go home, except for the kids who use for Halloween. <laughs> I struggle, Mike, you can help me pull the buttons okay. together. No, two, uh, while I'm putting it on, I'll talk about this, see all the, the stuff on it. When I came through, my watch is caught, Bob. How'd you keep the moths out of this? I, I never have given any extra precaution at all. <laughs> Thank you. I never, never have given any extra precaution at all, but... But what, what I was going to say the story was when we came when I came through Camp Atterbury, we will close up quickly with, with the getting out of service. I got my discharge, but I still couldn't leave, nor could any of us, because of the fact we hadn't been paid. So what we do, were allowed to do, we took our, our uh, discharge and our uniforms over to a kind of Red Cross-like building where uh, volunteers from around Columbus and Atterbury and all had set up to, to sew stuff, and they took our discharges, and reading from that, determined what, what all went on in our uniforms. So everything, everything, all this decoration was determined by uh, oh. by those seamstresses. <laughs> these are your overseas. Yeah, these are each each one for six months overseas. This for a full three year three year hitch. Of course, the buck sergeant all. Yeah. And, and the one, this presidential unit citation I was telling you about is the blue the blue ribbon here. And what are these things up up here. What are okay, well I I can't seem to tell which one's which. Anyway, one is uh, the Asiatic Pacific. Combat with six okay. uh, six stars, six uh, bronze yeah. stars, and then the uh, uh, one the Luz Luzon invasion, Borneo Archipelago, mm -hmm. and the uh, Good Conduct Medal that everybody got, of course, yeah. and then the, the, the Victory Medal and the Philippine Liberation Medal. Yeah. So that's what, what all those. Uh, and you got over here your thirteenth Air Force. That's right. Thirteenth Air Force. Okay. But see, that's what I. Now I, I will say it's a little tight, but it's still. Fifty-four years later, I, fifty-four years later, I'm still getting into it. So thank you, Mike. As I say, I've never had my picture taken in this uniform before. Okay. Now yeah, let's get. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, why why would you shut it off that way? It's a, yeah. Okay. I think where we left off, Bob, was the uh, I was on more time. The warrior yeah. on more time observed the, the ceremony, and then we, <coughs> we waited for. Oh, maybe. Uh, three or four weeks old before we got to move up to Luzon, the island of Luzon, and Manila, Manila and Clark Field, and we flew into Clark Field. And the thing I remember about that flight was we flew over Corregidor. Remember all the fame of yeah. Corregidor? And all we, the pilot flew over and we made a, made a big circle around to get to look down on Corregidor. Anyway, we landed on Clark Field and we're, that was strictly for uh, debarkation to come home. Because I had enough points in the war and I already had enough points to get home, but it's a long process getting through everything. Anyway, <clears throat> we were stationed on Clark Field and all, strictly to get sent home. I ran into a cousin of mine who was a technical sergeant in the Air Corps, a communications man, and we were, got to buddy together for that period of time. And we were there uh, probably a month. We were on Clark Field waiting to get, get on board a ship and process and come home. And uh, we went into Fort Stotzenberg, which was a, one of the big old military, looked like much like Fort Harrison, big old military institute installation there and got to win there for uh, recreation. Anyway, we finally got on board ship again. They were looking for crews to fly new airplanes home and all, but nobody was volunteering. Nobody wanted to try out those planes that hadn't been test hopped yet. Anyway, I came home on by, by ship, and this was the uh, Admiral Admiral Mayo, Admiral something, I don't remember his first name, but Admiral Mayo was the name of this, uh, this ship, which was uh, uh, <coughs> transport ship sort of and then well not, not very big anyway we came home in 13 days my recollection there there was nothing outstanding about the trip also, except we didn't have to zigzag we came straight came home in a straight line so we made it 13 days instead of the 15 that it had taken us to, to get over there but my recollection of that trip was we were 
wondering when we were getting close we knew to San Francisco. And this is the God's truth. I mean, it, it was a cloudy day. And someone said, look, look, look. And I looked up and the clouds just broke away like a magic. And on the bright sun shining on the Golden Gate Bridge right over our heads. <laughs> and, and that was a, a thrilling sight to see. Well, you came, you left uh, under the Golden Gate Bridge and came, came back. back under the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. That's exactly right. Except it looked a lot better coming back than, 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 <laughs> than leaving. Anyway, we got into San Francisco and the same, same story with Stone. We went down to Stone and we were there for oh, maybe a week, two weeks or so, and then by train, and again, this was a reasonably nice train, didn't have, didn't have bunks or anything, we were, were no sleepers, though, but we came back from uh, Stoneman directly to uh, Indianapolis, and Indianapolis to the spur line down to uh, Atterbury, <coughs> and we're discharged then in, in Atterbury. Well, I got, got out about six o'clock in the evening, and it was still daylight, so I started hitchhiking from Atterbury, and I got as far as Brownstown, but just, you go from Atterbury to Seymour about 20 miles, then 20 more miles to Brownstown, and it got dark. So I called home, and I didn't know it at all. My brother had just gotten home. So he oh. got the car and came over and picked me up <coughs> with Barbara and his wife. <coughs> well, now, they, uh, they didn't give you transportation home. No, there was no transportation home. They just over. turned you loose. We got, our, we got our discharges and then went over, because we had to wait. We didn't get paid. We got our discharges. We had to wait for pay. And I had to yeah. wait a whole two days. I, mean, I was discharged technically on the 4th, but I didn't get paid on the 6th, so I had to wait for that. Anyway, the uh, you were done. Out the gate you went. <laughs> and a lot of us were out there hitchhiking, trying to get someplace else and from, from there. There weren't many cars. There were many there cars were on there. And the gasoline. You know. I never knew rationing about that. I went in service before rationing and the gasoline and all that. Oh. And I came home one time on leave. I remember the the right chief ration man, that, who was uh, not much older than I was, and a friend of mine, I came in and signed up for a little gasoline ration stamp so I could drive the car a little bit. As I walked out the door, he reached out, shook my hand real hard, and I walked out and had a whole handful of stamps. Oh. <laughs> ration stamps for gasoline. I did. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, you said Barbara met you. Uh, she was there. Yeah, she tried to pick her up. And, okay. And uh, how soon after that were you married? Well, this was December the uh, 6th, I guess. I got out December the 6th and we were married on January the 5th. So oh. after, after a four-year engagement, we finally got okay. around. But we were, Where were you married? We were married in Indianapolis. And uh, as a matter of fact, the, the Bedford, the minister of uh, my folks' church in Bedford, had gone to Indianapolis and he oh. married us in uh, Irvington, in Indianapolis. Did, the, did you mention the oh. Episcopal, Episcopal Church in Indianapolis? Uh, what, what, uh, what was your father's occupation? My, he was uh, well. My father was out of work for six years about uh, during the depression. Oh. He wouldn't take relief and all that. He didn't, never had a study. He worked every place they could find some work, but he didn't have a study job for six oh. years. But then he he was a, by trade. He was a miller. His family, not his family, didn't own it, but his, his father ran a feed mill. Uh -huh. And uh, grounding feed and stuff like that. Matter of fact, I started working at the age of six, weighing two pound sacks of meal. Uh -huh. Anyway, that that's what he was mainly a salesman, and uh, <clears throat> what they would do, and go out and sell the flour and the feed and all, and come back and, and mix it, and then go out and deliver. And I uh -huh. was in Bedford, living in Bedford. Uh -huh. And anyway, that's what he did. And then he went, became a, a safety man at uh, at Crane Naval Land. He went to work at Crane Naval Ammunition Depot mm -hmm. about the time and before I did, but about that time they. Uh, yeah. When they started building, he became a, a security man down there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so he retired from that. Yeah. How long ago did he die? He's been dead since 63. Oh. Yeah. No, 60, I'm sorry, 68. Our family mm -hmm. died in 63, 68 when he died. How did you uh, get to Crawfordsville? Well, that was, oh, long, that was, what was your career. Too. You got out of the service, then what did you do? Well, I went to school right away. We were married on January the 5th, and I started school in February at IU. Okay. And drove back and forth for a year, and then we moved up on, on campus. You were married then? We were married. We were married started. in January right away. You were going on went the GI married. Bill? Went on the GI, absolutely. On the GI Bill. And Barbara's job. I say oftentimes, I went to, to college on the sweat of my brow. Yeah. <laughs> she worked. She was working. Barbara was working right in the, uh, in the office of the university school, the laboratory school at, uh, at Bloomington. So we moved to Bloomington then for the last year and lived in, in an old barracks apartment. And then we got through. I 
being I think through Barbara's influence, but anyway, I was hired to teach at the university after I got my degree. A teacher. Got my, yeah. got my degree in June, was on the staff in, in September. Of uh, yeah. the IU. University School at IU, yeah, the laboratory school. What did uh, you teach? I taught social studies. Okay. And in fact, I had to go to school the summer before to take enough hours in social studies to qualify to teach for to have the job. Anyway, I did that, and then uh, we lived in this barracks, and a brand new apartment was built. They were just starting the, the building of new apartments then at that time. So uh, we moved out of the Army barracks after a year, and then we moved out of the Army barracks about 50 yards across the uh, across the road into a brand new apartment building. So, so then we went from there. We came out of teaching there, and then, but it's out in the field. So it was not my field. So I got a job in Martinsville, teaching speech and driving back and forth to Bloomington to where I working on my masters, which I finished the first year we were in Martinsville. Uh -huh. So I stayed there a couple more years, and then after the two years there, I was making $3,000 a year, big money. Okay. I was teaching at IU for $2,000 a year, so I made $3,000 in Martinsville teaching speech. And then an the examination came along for an investigator of what was happening with the, the uh, Atomic Energy Commission at that time was not very pleased with what the FBI was doing in terms of their security investigations for, yeah. for communists primarily. And they asked the Civil Service Commission, the United States Civil Service Commission, who had a very small investigation division, to take over the investigation of the Atomic Energy Commission employees. Mm -hmm. And I have a cabinet, but they hired about 200 new people across the country. The very first ones they hired, and I was one of, that, one of that group. So I was a federal agent for just about a year, and then got a, what's supposed to be a promotion. I became, I went into management for the Civil Service Commission. And ended up then as the Indiana director or representative for the entire U.S. Civil Service Commission operation in the state of Indiana. Mm -hmm. And then, fortunate enough, I got another promotion at the end of that year, the first year I was here, it was going to take me to Washington, D.C. I wanted no part of that. As a matter of fact, General Bean, who was the commanding general at Fort Harrison at that time, was one of the people that I worked with. And I said, General Bean, you've just come back from six months in Washington. What would you think if I uh, asked you what your opinion is about going back? The day they tell me I have to go back is the day I retire. I said, thank you, you told me what I wanted to know, so I decided I didn't want anything in Washington, so I went. And as a matter of fact, I was on the Bloomington campus working, uh, working something or other and came upon one of the uh, director of the Division of Research and Field Services at Indiana University and told him my dilemma. I said, do you think I might be able to find a principal's job or something to do that? And he said, well, if you really are serious about this, come to work for me. Mm -hmm. So I went back as assistant director to Division of Research and Field Services in the University School of Education. And uh, in one year, I finished 10 hours of coursework and uh, drove about 15,000 miles to the university and uh, got my doctor's degree. So all field, that was done. Field service, what do you do? University of Division, the Division of University of Field Services, primarily that's surveys that are conducted for school systems to determine what their, their building plans might be. A school said, for example, Bob, besides the word, well, like, like uh, Frankfurt, for example, my son's going to superintendent next year. Oh. I mean, uh, Frankfurt decided they wanted to expand, so they, we, we, we would go in and survey all their school districts to see where the people were living, where the population was like, they'd move and all, and give them presentations of what maybe they should do in terms of planning. Oh. Okay, here. how did we get to Crawfordsville? Well, I went into the uh, school business after I finished, finished my doctorate, then I stayed there for about three months, and. Uh, was hired to be assistant superintendent of uh, personnel in Birmingham, Michigan. Birmingham at that time was one of the showcase schools across the country, and so I considered it as did the superintendent up there as kind of a, an internship, which it was an internship. So I went up there as uh, assistant superintendent for two years, and got a call from a fellow named Butch Shear in Crawfordsville. Oh. I don't think everyone in this town knows and remembers varying degrees of loving kindness and all, and Butch was the greatest guy in the world as far as, as I'm concerned. Anyway, Butch gave a call to the telephone and asked if I was interested in uh, coming to Crawford's. All do you have me here from? Okay. Well, the IU placement office. Oh, said, okay. Bob Hunt, who was president of the uh, school board at that time, said, uh, of course, Bob and Butch then came to Birmingham to interview, stand on the street corner and interview people about whether or not I, he thought I should, they, they thought I should, could handle the job of being a superintendent. So uh, I was hired by Butch, and Bob said, told me later on, he said, so and so, I don't forget who it was, he was talking to, he said, well, there's this guy, Harrison Birmingham, but you can't touch him, you can't get him. Bob said, I just showed him I could. 
Well, I think it worked for Hunt and Shearer and Bernard Perry and names that Jack Alexander and, and John Lewis and uh, Estella oh. Cummings were the school board at that time. Who was on the board? Gene Trasper, Estella Cummings, uh, Bernard Perry, yeah. Butch Shearer, and uh, Jack John, Lewis, John Lewis. John Lewis. Jack was on later. Jack came on the next oh. year after I got here. Jack came on. Okay. And uh, that was the school board at that time. And anyway, that's how I got to Parfield. I came to Parfield on the superintendent. How long were you? In school? August of 59. How long were you a school board? Uh, Six years. Okay. During that time, we built the, well, the built all, the, all these school buildings they're saying are obsolete now. We built one while I was superintendent. Yeah. Built tunnel when you were. Oh, yeah. Completely. Tore down the old building and built the new. Yeah. yeah. All the, Matter of fact, I, I tease them, they say that uh, all that involved, the, the, when the bank decided they wanted a new president, they said, well, Cash, you've been spending so much money, why don't you move across town to save a little bit? So, uh, so, so in 1965, then I went to the First National Bank as president of the bank. Uh, John Barwin was there. John was the trust officer at that time. John had been, as you, you remember, Bob, John was the, the county superintendent, which is an entirely different It was the same kind of different career you had. Right, in that sense, the county superintendent is an entirely different kind of a job from a, a city superintendent. Yeah. In that sense, but John, again, the finest person to ever walk the face of this earth, I think, was John Barrowman. And uh, John was already uh, in the bank at that time as trust officer. Oh, he was yeah. when you got there. He was there. already there when I got there, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> uh, during that time, of course, the First National Bank became Bank One. That's right. Much uh, that was my last official act. Sign off. I became a director of Bank One and sold sold the First National Bank on behalf, of course, of the stockholders. Sold the First National Bank to, to Bank One. Mm -hmm. And uh, gosh, have we ended your career? How long have well, you been retired? I've been, been retired <laughs> since '85, Bob. <laughs> I stayed on the board, the Bank One board, until well, one of the first things I did when I became president of First National was set a new policy. You had to retire at the age of seventy. Well, I, it caught me. Uh -huh. When I got there, I had to quit. But uh, how when was that? That was, though. Well, right, let's see, I'm 70 in uh, 92. Uh -huh. Seven years ago. But you, I retired from active, active work in 85. Uh -huh. You've uh, been on some other boards, too. You've been, what have you been working on that Community well, Foundation? Well, Community Foundation. I was one of the originators of the Community Foundation and the Educational Foundation. Um, and then the Cultural Foundation, the old jail, and uh, John, matter of fact, I say all the time that John Barman, and you were very much involved in that too, but, but John, the idea, I mean, germinated really with Max Tannenbaum and John Barman and I sitting in my office, where Max got the idea of what, what has now become the old jail museum. Yeah. Okay, I guess. And during that time, of course, Barman was on the, on the historical society board, treasurer and the historical yeah. society, and I was all with those others. Anyway, and this is after retirement, though. We started the uh, Community Foundation and the Educational Foundation, both after I retired. You know, one of the things we always ask uh, about it is, uh, hey, do you go to any reunions if you're out there? Do you Never have, have any to my knowledge, uh, I had contact with quite a few, not quite a few, but half a dozen or so of them after the war, but completely lost track now. I mean, uh -huh. and, uh, through the years, and has had no contact with, with any of them. As a matter of fact, a few of them from home, of course, are dead. I mean, yeah. those that I had friends in Bedford and all that I knew before the war and all that were in the war that I know now still. But, but no, in terms of buddies, I don't have any of them that I followed through with very long after the war. Mm -hmm. And to my knowledge, I mean, our, our Air Force, and I'm, I'm sure some of the individual units may have uh, reunions, but yeah. the ours never did. Yeah, I have I have a brother-in-law who, he was in the Air Force, and he, he goes to reunions every year. Well, I think a lot of them do. I mean, I think yeah. they become more, more after 25 years or so, you're more apt to go than you were in the first 25 years. Yeah, that's right. And that's what I learned from most people anyway. Uh, have you, uh, did you ever get back to the South Pacific? No, never gotten the back there. No, never. You probably never it, wanted to. Well, well, in a way, I wouldn't mind in a way, but I, I don't, uh, to me, again, getting back to Jack and Dean, well, they went to New Guinea and many other places they've been, and they thought it was just, just great. Well, I never thought, of, 
I lost anything in New Guinea. I always wanted to go to Australia, but as close as I was, I never got the chance, to, or New oh. Zealand, I mean, but never got the chance to get yeah. down there. Well, I know Dick and Lou finally got to gun out there they, 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 at their age. We all were that our age, we never felt that we'd be able to take it. Well, that's the that way part. with me, that long yeah. flight, not more than I say, but been there, done that, and all that. Yeah. Sure, it'd be entirely different now, but at least. Uh, well, Mark, uh, we, you know, you've had some, such a career uh, since the war. I, I, have I covered everything? Well, I don't think of anything yet. Family, you want to get into family? Yeah, yeah, well, oh, now you said earlier you, just, want, you want to be sure yeah, to talk about kids. Let, let's talk about your kids. Those, those proud grandpa gets to come in and they can say anything you <laughs> want to about them. They're probably the only ones what's, going to be, what's they're, happened to they're them? the only ones who are going to be watching this probably in <laughs> another 10 or 15 years, Bob. Well, Barbara and I uh, have three children. Kevin is our, our oldest, and Kevin is uh, now superintendent of Hall Creek Flat Rock. School Corporation down north of Columbus, but he will become next year. He's becoming the superintendent of Frankfurt, Indiana, which of course we all know. Not a little closer to us anyway. Here, Kevin is uh, married to Tolene McCauley. Married to Lean McCauley. They have three children. They keep them. Kevin has his bachelor's and doctorate from Indiana University, and his master's from Purdue. Mm -hmm. Lean has her doctorate in pharmacy from Purdue, so they don't have too much to fight over. The Indiana Purdue thing, all of the kids sometimes. Yeah. They're, they're four red-headed children. Some, like, have a little something Everybody's red-headed. Um, that's right. All four of them are red-headed. They, they lost their first one. And, uh, Sean was born, lived about two or three hours and all. And then the second one is now 13, is red-headed Zachary, of course. And then uh, followed up by his older older sister, who is 11 now, uh, Alyssa. And then Johanna came along. And Johanna is eight now. And Jojo, we call her. And then Serena. The baby is just starting five now, coming up on six. They live just north of. Uh, oh, who's kids are these? These are Kevin's kids. Okay. Kevin and Tulane. They live about uh, uh, two miles south of Hope, Indiana, where Kevin's school is located, where his uh, office is located in Hope, Indiana. And I found since he went there, there are several friends of ours around Corpusville who have a relationship with with Hope. Anyway, our second child then is Sarah. Sarah's who not a graduate of Vanderbilt University and mathematics and computer science and civil engineering. She went directly to Houston after she graduated from Vanderbilt and was a systems analyst. As a matter of fact, she, she, she frankly, the whole title is she's vice president of an international consulting firm. We, we tell her, and she actually is. We have a little teasing story about, about that. Anyway, Sarah has a two and a half year old who has taken over the whole family. All the other, the other kids and the cousins fight over who gets to play with, with Jill. Anyway, Jill at two and a half, and then our third child is, is Anne and uh, has her bachelor's from uh, North Illinois University in economics. Her husband has his MBA from North, North Illinois, says that what she learned in that four years in economics is how to write checks. Uh -huh. Mike then has his, uh, his MBA from Northern, he's a graduate of, uh, of Augustana College, and he's uh, president now of a cosmetics manufacturing firm in, at Lance in New Jersey and in California. And uh, that man's kind of well proved but she stayed home now and has three great kids. I mean, Andrew is 14 and over six feet tall now, nearly six feet tall at 14. Then he has a younger sister, 12. Then uh, Lauren, and then Jordan, the live wire of the group, is uh, is eight now. So anyway, that's that's the family in a nutshell running through the. I don't think I missed any of them. Any, eight grandchildren, and uh, so pleased with. That's with wonderful. Or would that we. Some of the rest of us had that many grandchildren. Well, but you've got that. Well, Mark. I'll kick out of Robbie. We got, we got, a red, we got one red ass. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> well, I think we, we're just going to say thanks. Oh, <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Great. Been a pleasure. Great.